In the short space of time that we've been looking at inverse functions at all at the moment, we haven't really touched calculus much, except for one thing. And it was either first or second lesson, probably the second lesson, that we looked at inverse functions, generally speaking. There was one thing we looked at that was relevant to differentiation and inverse functions. Not inverse tree functions, just inverse functions in general. Do you remember what that was? What, what point, what property did we notice? Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, all right, we we're looking at gradient functions. If you have an increasing function, its inverse will also be increasing, right? Its concavity will reverse, we noticed that, okay? But when it gets down to like the nuts and bolts of the algebra of the gradient function, what did we notice? We gave an example. Um, I think it was, oh. I think it was with this, right? Oh. Uh, X cubed minus one or something like this, okay? If we call this one Y, we noticed if you rephrased it, if you made X the subject and then differentiated it again, you wouldn't differentiate with respect to x if you rearranged, right? What would you differentiate with respect to? You differentiate with respect to y because I'm just doing this from memory. I think it's going to be something like this. Y is the independent variable now, right? So you differentiate with respect to that instead of x. What was the relationship that we got out after we got to the end of this? What did we conclude? Do you remember? Yeah. dy and dx times dx and dy equals to y. Very good. So this is what we concluded that we've kind of used this result before when we were proving um, we we're proving the derivatives of the trig functions uh, in the first place. But we kind of didn't really prove it. Uh, we just said, hey, that's kind of interesting. These don't just look like fractions. They behave like fractions, which makes sense because that's where they came from, right? These are all from first principles, which just rise over y. Okay. And therefore, the other way of saying this is to make either of these a subject. So for instance, I could say that dx on dy is just the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function. Does that make sense? So we looked at this, and the import for that for us was, OK, if you want to find a function and its inverse, and you want to know some derivatives, right? If you look at the inverse and it differentiating is gross, like if it has chain rule or quotient rule or something you want to avoid, this is kind of a nice neat trick that you can take, right? You just get the original derivative and then you turn it upside down. That's nice, okay? But it's more powerful than that. We're going to demonstrate that today when we have a look at these inverse trig functions. Now, ordinarily, when we do anything to do with trig, right, we have three functions and we pretty much always go in this order. And do you remember why we go in this order? Like, it's not just arbitrary. Why is this the order that makes sense? Okay, so you've gone all the way back to calculus. Like even before calculus, like just understanding, like say in right angle triangles and um, in sine rule and cosine rule, etc. We always start with sine, then we go to cos, then we go to tan. What does cos stand for again? Cosine. Cosine, cosine it's the complement of sine. So it doesn't really make sense to do anything with this because it kind of depends on this. It gets its definition from sine. And of course, tan is defined by sine and cos. Okay, so this order makes sense. And we always did this uh, you know, yesterday and um, earlier. We did it in this order. Today, I'm actually going to start at the end of the list. I'm not going to tell you why yet. I hope as we go through it, you realize, oh, okay, makes sense to start at the end this time. But let's consider, okay, consider y equals 10x. Okay, we're going to start with 10 this time. Now, in order to get our inverse function, right, y equals 10x rather dramatically fails the horizontal line test, so we restricted the domain. Where do we restrict it again? Where do we want it? Yeah, we want it from negative pi on 2 to pi on 2, and we do not want the boundaries, right? So I'm going to place that restriction in there. Okay, now knowing that, I can now say, therefore, x is equal to tan inverse of y. Does that make sense? Only, only having made this domain restriction, I can now say this, because this doesn't exist everywhere, as we've pointed out. Okay. Now, if we want to know, therefore, the derivative of this inverse function now, this is the perfect time when this property is going to be useful to us. Because I don't even know where to start on this. Um, I don't know. However, Okay, what we're going to try and do first before we um, dig into the algebra of it is, let's try and make a prediction. Get another colour out with me. In mathematics, you should always predict. Always make a prediction. When you don't know what something's going to be, always make a prediction. Because if you're right about your prediction, it feels awesome. You're like, yes, I'm really smart. 
But if you're wrong, you get the opportunity to question your assumptions and you learn something. Okay, so always predict, always predict. So I want you to think about this guy. If um, you've got tan inverse, okay? If tan inverse is what you're differentiating, um, let's call this, let's give it a name. Let's call, it, let's call that f dash for now. Okay, let's just name that. Oh, I could have gone to you, I suppose. Um, this will make the, these notes a little easier for you to refer to later. What kinds of things can we know, can we guess, can we predict about f dash? Because you know what tan inverse looks like. You've got a picture of it in your mind, okay? What kinds of things can you think about? I can think of at least one, two, three things that we can predict about the derivative based on what you already know. Anyone want to start us off? Yeah. Okay, so I've got, it sort of starts off shallow, and then it gets steeper, and then it sort of goes shallow again, okay? So just let me take a step back to say something even more general. That means that, broadly speaking, it's an increasing function. Do you agree with that? So what does that mean about f dash? Always positive, right? f dash x is greater than zero for all real values of x. That's because tan inverse is an increasing function. Good, that's something I know. What else can I predict? Yeah, Doris. Um, actually, I don't know. No. That's okay. Yeah, someone else. Yeah, right now. Uh, the domain is all the x. Okay, so I'm expecting uh, this should be... I shouldn't expect any restrictions on whatever the derivative is going to be. I don't want any holes in it because tan inverse has no holes, okay? So that's a good thing. That's not one of the things I originally thought, so now I've got four things. Brendan. It's an even function. Oh, it's an even function. Mm. Yeah, yeah. okay, I'll go with that. Now let's just think about that for a second. You might, need, you might need a bit of a picture here now more than something that's in your head. We know what tan inverse looks like. Here's what I'm looking at, okay? Now what, is it, what does it mean to be an even function? That means on the left-hand side and the right-hand side you're getting identical behavior. Does that make sense? And that does check out, right? Like you look at the opposite ends and you've got a very shallow gradient. So a gradient which approaches zero, right? And then in the middle here, as I go in, you're getting the same kind of gradient, right? Okay, I'll go with that. I'm going to take that as, um, oh, actually, sorry, we'll, we'll say it another way. We have algebra for how to state if a function is even, right? If I'm calling the derivative f dash, what can I say about f dash if it is an even function? F dash, f -dash, f -dash, f -dash, f -dash is equals, yeah, very good. Okay, now I'm going to take that, and there's a, one of the points I was thinking about is um, the specific values for which this is the case, right? Off at our extremities, I mean, there's not very much interesting happening, no stationary points, nothing like that. At the extremities, the limit as x approaches plus and minus infinity of my gradient function, what is the limit? The limit's actually equal to something, and the answer is zero, right? I'm approaching these asymptotes, which are horizontal, okay? Now, one last thing that I'm going to mention. Uh, all of this is nice. There's actually one value that I actually know the value of the derivative at that point, right? When x equals zero, what am I expecting the gradient to be? Zero. One. No, infinity. One. No, sorry. It's a turning point. When x equals, so where am I looking? I'm looking here, right? I'm looking there. And where this came from was y equals tan x, and I know what the gradient of y equals tan x is, regular tan x. Then when you reflect across y equals x, what happens to that? In this case, it's going to be the same, isn't it? Like, I mean, don't, don't draw this. But if you take a line like, say, y equals 2x, and you reflect it across our y equals x line to get the inverse, right? The gradient used to be 2, and then the gradient of the inverse will be... Well, what will, will the gradient of the inverse be? It'll be a half, right? If I said, okay, take a gradient of uh, <coughs> 3, then the gradient of the inverse will be a third. a third, okay? Now, the gradient of 10x, regular 10x, at that point is 1. So the gradient of its inverse will be also 1. So I can say f dash at 0 should be 1. Do you agree with that? 